God is great. God is good. You know, sometimes when you're going through stuff that's really hard, you need to know that God is great. And sometimes you're going through things and you don't know the answer and it seems like a mystery. And sometimes it even hurts. And you need to know that God is good. The beauty is that he is always great and he is always good. Sometimes you need him to be great goodness because of what you're going through. There's no gathering of this size. When we come together, there isn't somebody that needs to know God is great, God is good. You need to be able to declare it into the circumstance that you're in. You need to be able to believe it for what you're going through. So I want you, as we stand here this morning, before we go back and just sing that again, I want you to take whatever it is and I want you to lay it before the Lord and declare over it. My God is great. He's greater than this. My God is good. He's better than this. It could be a sickness in your body. He's greater. It could be financial struggle that you're going through. He's greater. And maybe you question your own faith or you're struggling with some behavior that you know isn't right. He's good. He's better than that. So I want you to take whatever it is. And maybe you're in that great spot in life where it's just really good now. Take that and put it before your great and good God and say, God, I believe in this, in this specific thing, you are great and you are good. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that as our Papa and as our King, you are good and you are great and there is nothing that anyone in this room is walking through that you are not greater than, that you are not better than. So we bring to you our physical illnesses. We bring to you our struggles in our families. We bring to you our prodigals. We bring to you our pain. We bring to you our questions and we declare and confess over them. You are good and your mercy endures forever. You are better than this. You are stronger than this. You are greater than this. And no matter what the enemy is saying to us right now, your truth, your word, is what we base our life on. You are our good, good Father. And we're so grateful we can lay this before you and know that you are great and that you are good. Our Papa, let's sing that again. No more love, you have been Before you sit down, I want you to turn and look at somebody and say, your papa, he's really good. Go ahead, tell him that. Encourage him. We just want to bless our pastor and his wife, Pastor Ann. We have the most wonderful pastor. You know, Mike and I get to be four times this summer, maybe five. We've been with other pastors and their wives. And, you know, um, our pastor and his wife have laid down their life for the gospel of Amen. Jesus Christ. They've laid down their life for young people. Ann Hoy is a warrior for young people. Yeah. She's been a warrior since she's probably been 18, 17 years old. But I just want to honor them today. We love them so much. And Mike and I consider it, you know, how the Lord brought us in to be under Pastor Ann and Pastor Jeff's ministry. 
It's just amazing, and it's such an honor to serve under people and Pastor Paul and the staff, people of integrity, people that have laid down their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we just bless them and honor them today, Lord. Help their rest mm. to be completed in you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, babe. I agree with that 100%. It's such an honor to stand in his shoes when he's away. I, I just feel so privileged to do it. In fact, we were, we were chatting back and forth this week, and he said, it's interesting that God had this particular lesson fall in your purview because he said, you have such a unique perspective. And what he was talking about, and you kind of have to know a little bit of my backstory. This will help you understand the things that I pulled out of Peter this week. I, uh, I was raised in a pastor's home. I literally cut my teeth on church pews. That's all my dad did for 60 years of his life. So I grew up in church. That's all I ever knew. I started preaching when I was a teenager. I was traveling around preaching youth conferences and went to college early, graduated from college early. We started pastoring our first church when I was 20 years old, as if I knew something. And, uh, and for better than 20 years, we were in full-time vocational ministry. We pastored and uh, I was a worship leader and we spent our life there. That's all I had known for better than the first 40 years of my life. Many of you know our story. I, I crashed and burned when I was a little over 40. And so we had to kind of start all over again. And for the first time in my life, at 40 years of age, I had to find a job. Because all I'd ever done, I'd literally never drawn a paycheck outside of a church. And God gave us a new start and a new career, which I've been at now for over 23 years. God blessed me into a company that has kept me for 23 years. And um, so I spent, literally my adult life has been divided in two. Half of it working in the church, half of it working in the marketplace. And, and, and we left here last night and, and I went home and there was something in my spirit that was bugging me. And I woke up with a couple of strange dreams during the night. And I got up this morning and I was saying, well, what is this? Because we had a wonderful time together. And I realized what the Bible calls the burden of the Lord. It's when you connect with something that's on God's heart to the degree that you feel what he feels. And I feel that for this particular subject because I've lived in those worlds. And because for 23 years, I've been just like most of you. I've spent my life working for someone, working to make a living, working in a secular environment, in a non-church environment. And in fact, I went from pastoring to financial services. I work on Wall Street. So, was, so I woke up one morning and the Lord said, you work in the mouth of mammon. You talk about a transition going from pastoring a church to working in the you know, stock market. And what I've come to realize is the church has committed a sin against itself by desacralizing what you do every day of your life. For too often, the heroes of the faith were always missionaries and pastors. Those are the people we talk about, people that were doing the work of God, right? And the rest of us, we were working so we could give money so they could do the work of God. That's kind of how we viewed it. And I'm on a crusade in my life. To see the kingdom of God come and the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. For us here, that means it at SpaceX like it is in heaven. At Harris like it is in heaven. Everywhere you go as a human who loves Jesus, you carry his presence and you bring sacredness to that space. That's what Peter talks about in the text that we're going to look at. I want to try to unpack that with you this morning. From that unique perspective, I know what it is to spend my life immersed in the church 
And I know what it is to spend half of my life immersed in the marketplace. And I want to tell you, there is a bridge God is building in this generation between those two things. Where the kingdom of God will be as alive and real to you in your occupation as it is when we stand here and sing of the goodness of God. Look with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 18. Paul, Peter uses the word servants. We're going, to, we're going to attach our concept of employee to that, okay? Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows, while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten for it and you endure? But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure, well, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this, you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. If you wouldn't mind, would you stand and pray with me over the word of God? Father, I thank you as Mike told us earlier that you didn't leave us without guidance. You left us with your living and abiding word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I thank you for Peter, the ultimate blue-collar guy who wrote these words to us in our space as much as to that first century church. Help us to hear the echo of your voice in these ancient words in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks. I mentioned I, I grew up in church. That means mama was a pastor's wife and I was a PK, a preacher's kid. If you haven't heard about them, they're a different breed. Um, mama believed in church. So much so that growing up, we actually had two wardrobes. She called it like this, your everyday clothes and your church clothes. And never the twain shall meet. So in other words, your everyday clothes, that was for playing and you can get them dirty, you do whatever you, but God forbid you get them church clothes dirty. And we used to have these things in church where I grew up, they, they were called all day singings and dinner on the ground. It was heaven to a little boy. Because after church, which went on a little too long, you go out and there'd be just tables strewn with food. Entire tables of nothing but banana pudding. Can you say amen for banana pudding? But as a little kid, I was in my church clothes. We couldn't play on the church grounds. We couldn't run around with all those crazy other kids that were there. And, and we didn't want to get food on our church clothes. Because there was a very fine, distinct chasm between your everyday clothes and your church clothes. Unfortunately, the church created a theology very much like my mom's clothesology. We have our everyday stuff and we have church stuff. We use the terms sacred and secular. It's the worst dichotomy that the church of Jesus Christ has ever set up in its 2000 years. It's this disenfranchisement 
of what you do every day for the majority of your life from the living faith of the church. As if this is what's important, what we're doing right now, and that stuff out there, well, that's what you survive so you can get back here next week and, you know, get your tank filled. That the Sunday, Monday chasm is massive and impossible to ignore. When we use the word sacred, we tend to mean things that are related solely to the service and worship of God. The word secular, we use that for kind of everything else. Everything is not church. Uh, Wally, you'll remember this. We used to talk about vocation and avocation. Vocation being what you're called to do and avocation being all the rest of your life. The separation between those two has created more distance from the kingdom of God than almost anything else we've seen in church history. And here's the reality. When Jesus came, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that chasm was bridged. That wall of separation was decimated. Jesus came, got all up in our business by taking on a skin suit and living his daily life exactly like we do. In fact, he made sure that he picked a, a, a place where he would have an occupation where he'd get good and dirty. He was a carpenter. Sometimes they worked with stones, sometimes they worked with wood, but whatever they did, there was dust involved. And wherever he went, he was shaking off dust. Because he wanted the gospel to be greasy. He wanted it to be down here where we are. And he came to prove to us that no morally upright occupation that you choose is exempt from you experiencing and expressing the presence and the power and the purpose of God. Here, here's a fun fact for you. Jesus spent 10 times as much of his life being a carpenter as he did being a rabbi. He lived 33 years, we think. The last three he spent being the rabbi of our New Testament. But for the first 30 years of his life, he was covered in sawdust. He was raised by a carpenter who may well have died when he was a young teenager, which left him as the oldest sibling to be the, the breadwinner for the family. So he picked up the chisel and the hammer and the stone and the wood and he created Here's the amazing part. He's actually referred to in the book of Mark by the people of Nazareth as, isn't this the carpenter? Not a carpenter. The carpenter. In other words, isn't this the best carpenter in Nazareth? Everybody wanted to have something Jesus made in their house. See, he was the carpenter of their town. My contention is the reason he was such a great rabbi was that he was a great carpenter. All of that was on purpose. It's the divine, the divine idea behind what we call incarnation. See, the incarnation of Jesus Christ was not a consummation. It wasn't an end. It was an initiation. It was a beginning. It was an invitation to you to live an incarnate lifestyle. In other words, the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, working itself out to you in the dust of your occupation. I, I, if, if, if I can accomplish anything in this room this morning, I want to lift your head and I want you to see what you do as an expression of the kingdom of God. That you carry eternal life into that very earthy space. In fact, and I had to learn this because, you know, I spent my whole life in, in church and then all of a sudden, 40 years old, I'm writing my first resume. And, and, and I remember when I, when I got a call from my company that I work for now and they said, we like your resume. And I went, why? I don't know anything about stock market. I don't know anything about, about teaching seminars about trading. You know what they said? You've been talking to people your entire life. That's what we want. They hired me because they knew how to preach. And set me up as an evangelist in their business. 
You see, God does that kind of thing. He sanctifies, he sacramentalizes what we do by invading the space where we work. Work is the proving ground for your confessed belief system and your professed experience with Jesus Christ. It's where eternity wears everyday clothes. I desperately want to see us get a new vision of the everyday, every man ministry. I want us once again to believe what Jesus modeled. I want us to have heroes that we point to who are passionate, missional, marketplace missionaries. You see, last week we talked about how Peter set us aside and he said look you got to realize you're sojourners and exiles here you're different you're distinctive you live with the citizenship in another kingdom because another king reigns over your life and the first way he said we could demonstrate that is in our submission to authority but he immediately turns and says let me tell you the other place you can demonstrate the reign of the king in your life it's in your work world. It's where you spend most of your time for most of your life. If this isn't true, then a good solid one third of your life is a waste. Every one of us will work on average 90,000 hours in our lives. Some of you that are my age go, yep, I work and I feel that stuff in 90,000 hours. The majority of our time for the majority of our life is spent in our occupation. It would make no sense if that isn't a space where the kingdom of God can be expressed and released. I guess it seems to me that there's hardly a better space in all of the world for the love of God, the life of God, the reality and the character of Jesus the release of the creativity of the creator than in the space where you make your living. Now, just a quick aside, because Diane asked me this when we got in the car last night. She said, but he uses the word servant or in some translations, slave. And we, we, we don't want to equate ourselves with slaves. Well, you need to understand that in the first century, slavery was not like generally, at least in the nation of Israel, not like slavery we saw in the history of the United States. The word in Greek is oiketos. The Greek word for house is oikos. You see how they're related? So in oiketos, this is a person who works in a home. Think of him as a domestic worker, a house worker. So what he's addressing is a person who has to work to pay the bills. Uh, most slavery in, in the Jewish community, at least, and that's who, who Peter would have been writing to, most of them who became servants, or what we might call slaves, were indentured because of some sort of debt. So they got in over their heads. Now, it could have been because of some tragedy in their life. It could have been because they were irresponsible. It could have been because mom and dad got in debt and dumped it on them, and they had to pay it off. But when you think of the slave or the servant of this passage, it's just somebody who had to work to pay the bills. Sound familiar? You see... I'm absolutely convinced as I've read these words of Peter that he has boiled this whole rather complex talk, topic down to two things. He basically says to us, if you want to see the kingdom of God expressed in your everyday life, if you want to see the kingdom come in the earthiness of your job as it is in heaven, there's only two things you need to remember. It's not about who the boss is. That's number one. It's not about who the boss is. I think it's fascinating that Peter paints the picture in these first few verses of a really bad boss. It's almost like he's saying, hey, let me set this scenario up for you. Let me paint a picture of the worst boss you ever had. And let you know that in that space, you can demonstrate the kingdom. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because some of you may have him now. But anybody here ever have a bad boss? Like a really bad boss? Like a boss you wanted to put in a body bag? That kind of boss? 
I'd say most of us at some point do. It's interesting. Peter says, you need, to, you need to submit and work toward the good of a boss that you have, whether he is the good and considerate kind or the Greek word is harsh. So whether he's the nice boss or the mean boss, whether he's the boss that supports and affirms you or as is more often the case, the one that challenges you with too many tasks, the one that has impossible expectations, most of which are not communicated to you. Increasingly heavy workloads without increasing pay. That kind of boss. He said, bosses with these unkind attitudes are creating a backdrop for you to express the kingdom of God. He even takes it farther. He says, not only can bosses stretch you bosses will test you can anyone say amen they will test you he talks about the unkind unjust suffering that you go through at work where you do your best and it doesn't work out where you you work longer hours but you don't get more pay where you're overlooked for the promotion that you deserved whether you're abused or accused there's that atmosphere where it's just like he's always trying to push your buttons. He also says bosses may offend you. They may say things, they may do things that literally give you the opportunity to pick up offense at them and manifest judgment toward them. And he even went so far to say his bosses may abuse you. He said, sometimes you do good and you get beaten for it. Now, we know that you can't get away with beating your employees in this, in, at least in modern culture, unless you use words or psychological manipulation or emotional mistreatment. So he's saying, look, I know this is the worst case scenario. Bosses will stretch you and test you and offend you and abuse you. And all of that, if you cling to purpose, will mature you. Thanks, Peter. It, I told Diane this morning, we we're sitting on our back porch talking about this. And I said, isn't it fascinating that in the middle of this discussion of your work life, Peter turns and says, this is your opportunity to be like Jesus. To this, you were called because Jesus suffered for you that you could walk in his steps. Imagine what it would do for our understanding of where we work if every time we walked into work, we realized we were walking in his steps. The incarnation of Jesus, the fact that he came to a poor place to poor people, the, the fact that he was born in a, uh, in a manger, in a stable, the fact that he worked as a carpenter, he was trying to telegraph to us that there was no place where the kingdom of God cannot thrive. You see, it is hanging on to purpose that changes everything we go through so Peter says, look, if you want to understand the expression of the kingdom in your job, remember, it's not about who the boss is. It's all about who you are. As I read through this, I started thinking, because I have to have hooks that I can hang my hat on, you know, stuff to remember. And, and, and as I read this, and Peter turns into this eloquent passage about Jesus suffering and how he was abused, but he didn't react and and, 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 and how it was through that suffering that we get healed. And he turns in the middle of this discussion of a nasty boss. And how that can be a place and a space for you to express the kingdom. He turns to painting the picture of Jesus for us. And in that, I found four things. If you don't get everything else, please hang on to these four things. This is how the kingdom of God can come at your job. First, be spiritual. Now, let me define what I mean. I'm not talking about the guy that comes into work and 
he's obnoxiously religious. You know what I mean? He's wearing his t-shirt, air things, praise God, hallelujah. You know what I mean? You ever seen one of those guys? And you just look at him and go, would you just for a few minutes, stop. Just, just stop. I'm not talking about that. Being spiritual is living from your spirit. That's the deepest part of you. It's the place where you and Jesus Christ commune as one. So on our jobs, our, our responsibility is to be spiritual. In other words, to be what we are inside in all of the space that we occupy out here. Refuse to live in reaction. Live instead in response. I think it's interesting that Peter uses this discussion. When Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile again. When he was abused, he didn't abuse back. What he was saying was, Jesus went through some real junk, but he didn't live in reaction to the stuff he was encountering. He lived in response to his father in that situation. Being spiritual is living from the deep core values that are established by your covenant with Jesus Christ. Look at these scriptures. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do it, do it with all your might. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You, you see that? Live and work passionately and with purpose. That's what he's saying. Be spiritual. Second, be sacramental. I love the sacraments of the church. The one that's most common you understand is the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the, the communion. But marriage is a sacrament. Baptism is a sacrament. A sacrament is an outward spiritual sign of an inward reality that you have. So it's this physical sign on the outside of what's going on on the inside. The idea of the sacramental is so beautifully illustrated when Jesus set up communion and he took two of the most common things in people's lives, the bread and the cup, and he imbued them with eternity so that we could never pick up bread and we could never pick up the cup again without remembering him. That's what sacrament does. And a sacramental worker is a worker who realizes in the earthiness of my job, in the everydayness, in the mundane and in the difficult, in the stress moments and in the moments where it seems like the day is dragging by, in all of those spaces, you carry presence. Enough of the presence of God to shift the atmosphere that you're working in. Be sacramental. Understand that the physical realm of your work can be a spiritual re release of the kingdom of God if you trust your father's care. Look at these scriptures. Maybe the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, Psalm 90, 17. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I believe one of the missing factors in the release of the kingdom of God in our occupations is we've lost the concept of the favor of God. Remember how it was said in scripture that when Jesus went home and he was obedient to his parents after his little, uh, you know, diversion at 12 years of age where he got lost for three days. It said that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. There is a thing, a real thing where the favor of God can rest on you and stuff happens for you that would not normally happen were it not for the finger of God at your job. I, I know this to be a reality for myself. Uh, we, we've experienced the favor of God in my work in su to such a degree that sometimes we just look at each other and laugh. And we go, how did we get here? How did this happen? This doesn't even make sense. It was the favor of God establishing the work of my hands. Proverbs 16, 3, commit your way to the Lord, commit to him whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. That's what happens when you're sacramental. When you decide that the physical reality of what you do has a deeply spiritual impact, when you do that, you open the door for the favor of God to be on you. 
This third one, I, I think it's one of the most important things. And it may be one of the most missing pieces. Be solutionary. When, when I got into the marketplace, I suddenly realized something. I was on a team of about 50 people, most of whom weren't the brightest um, bulbs on the tree. But they knew how to run that company. You know what I mean? They knew how to tell the boss how to do his job. They knew how to go to him and say, we have this problem and this problem. This isn't working and this is wrong. Bosses don't need people who can come and point out the problem. They need people who come with a solution. I am absolutely convinced. The solutions to most of the greatest difficulties in all of our differing work environments rest inside the people of God. Why? Because we have a direct relationship with the creator. And if I have a direct relationship with the creator, one of the greatest ways I can express his image is to be creative. Creating solutions. I just have been praying, God, would you release the spirit of the creator in the lives of your people so that we walk into our work and that thing that hasn't worked in so long, we get a download from him that is an answer to it. And they have to sit up and say, hey, what was that? Be solutionary. I, I have a friend that pastors over in central Florida, brilliant fellow, and uh, he, he was, we were in a meeting and he did a talk on creativity and I called him. I said, I have to have that. And this particular quote just really struck me. He said, you're so much created in the image of your father that if you don't live as a creative, your heart will be sick. Creativity flows from your momentum with God and is engaged as we create. Creativity is applied imagination. I, I remember trying to write all this stuff down when he was talking. And a little later, he said something. It was about the only thing I actually got written down. He said, you have a choice. You will be creative or you will be toxic. Because creativity is this release of the life of God. And if I don't have a place where I release the creativity of God, it's, it gets like spoiled, rancid food inside me. Be solutionary. Deuteronomy 8.18. Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth. So as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors. Please hear me, friend. God wants to release creative ideas through you where you work to such a degree that people will note that you're bringing solutions to problems other people haven't been able to solve. And he does that so he'll confirm his covenant with you. In other words, God wants to be your business partner. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Imagine for a moment what would happen if every one of us who's still active in our occupation began to walk to work with the release of God's ideas for solutions to problems we're trying to get answers to. At our work. The last one. Be spiritual. Be sacramental. Be solutionary. Finally, be solid. I was so wounded one time when I was talking to an executive. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, I hired this guy because he was a Christian. And he's the worst worker I've ever had. I was like, oh, come on. You, you know, it's, it's really simple. We need to do good work. And we need to do work good. Our bosses should be looking at us and going, I don't know what makes you different, but do you have any friends like you? I want to hire them too. You see, being solid is about being dependable. It's about, it's about them looking at you and saying, man, that, 
that person always does a good job. And, and, and if they fail in an area, they come and they acknowledge it and they say, I need to work on that. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Again, referring to slaves that we're looking at as employees. Teach slaves to be subject to the masters and everything. Listen, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Wow. First of all, wow, because he has to tell them, uh, tell these guys to stop stealing from their bosses. Stop talking back to them. But he says, I want them to, I want them to become such good employees that their bosses can trust them. This is a very personal story. I can't go into the details of it, but I have, a, I have an awesome boss. Um, we had three brothers that owned our company. When I went to work for them, the youngest of the three brothers passed away. I'm actually older than all the people in my company. I'm the oldest guy in my company. And uh, a few years back, my boss called me and he knew my background. He knew I'd been a pastor. And he, he called me one day and there was some struggles that he was facing with his family. And he called me and he said, I need you to take your warden hat off and put your pastor hat on. And for three, four years, almost every day we had conversations that had nothing to do with my job. They were conversations you only have with someone you trust. Why did that happen? Because for all those years before that, I worked really hard. I outsold everybody in the company. I, I made sure that the quality of my work was as high as I could, I could make it. Why? Because I wanted to make myself trustworthy. Little did I know that the trust wasn't just about the company. He didn't just trust me as his employee. He trusted me as his friend. Be solid. Become trustworthy. Jesus used to express it like this. My father is always working. And I too am working. In other words, I'm co-laboring with my father at what he's given me to do. In Colossians chapter 3, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know what you, that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as his reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. My oldest son uh, is a carpenter. He's one of those carpenters that gets really dirty. You know, he came by the house the other day and I was like, are you in there somewhere? Covered in mud from sheet rocking and paint. And, but he called me one night last week on the way home from work and he was actually crying. He's, Kind of an emotional guy. I don't know where he gets that. It must be his mom. <clears throat> and he said, Dad, I've begun to rediscover. that My work has meaning. And I get to the end of the day now. And I want to know how God feels about what I did today. I want to show him my work. So be proud of it. See, what he's discovered is that his real payday is someday, not Friday. He works for a different master. When you work for a different master, then the quality of your work can underscore what you believe. You want to fulfill the great commandment, love God with all your heart, be spiritual. With all your soul, be sacramental. With all your mind, be solutionary. With all your strength, be solid. As I've wrestled with this, I, I, I tell you, it's been difficult for me. I, I loved being in ministry. I loved it. I think you've figured out by now I like to preach. And walking away from that and working in the marketplace, favor of God has been on us and he's blessed us. And, but I still wrestle with that. And what, I, and what I'm doing now, does it matter as much as what I used to do back when you knew me, Father Wally? I'm beginning to understand whatever you do, if you do it with all of your heart, 
as unto the Lord. It has kingdom significance. So I've, I've started asking myself some questions in the morning and reminding myself of some truths. Here's three simple things. I, I want to challenge you to start thinking about these every day as you get ready to go to work. Number one, you carry presence. Number two, you serve Christ. And number three, you make a difference. If I can convince myself every single morning that I'm walking into my work carrying the presence of Jesus, serving him as my boss, as my king, as my master, I will make a difference no matter what the day holds. In that conversation I had with my son this week, I told him something and he said, Dad, I never knew that. The very, very first time in the Bible that God talks about someone being filled with the Spirit, it's a couple of guys named Bezalel and Aholiab. They were the guys that God sent to Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's the very first time in the Bible he ever references anyone as being filled with the Spirit. It's in Exodus 31. Listen carefully to these words. This is God. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make, to create, to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed a holy ab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I've commanded you. It's so easy to think of the people who were really filled with the Spirit as, as being the people who handle the Word of God, who travel to foreign nations and give their lives and missions. People that work with children and young people. People who, who work in difficult sex trafficking to rescue girls. It's easy to think of them as the ones who are really filled with the Spirit. But the very first people in the Bible that God said, I put my Spirit in them, were carpenters. Seems to have a thing about carpenters, doesn't he? I want to encourage you. This isn't said for you to go home and go, oh, great, now I got to try to do better at work. I got to be as good at what I do as Jesus was at making stools. Yes, you do. The challenge before us is this. How will the kingdom of God come and the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is what Jesus taught us to pray, if I don't let him work in the earthiness of my job? You get up tomorrow morning and you head to work. You might be a teacher. Diane was a school teacher for 27 years, working with little ones. I used to watch her, just amazed. I told her one day, I said, I, I could never do that. I'd be in jail in three days. <laughs> Little rug rats. Maybe you're a, a homeschool mom. Maybe you're a carpenter. Maybe you're a professor. Maybe you work on rockets, pretty likely around here. Huh? The kingdom of God. Can come 
on your little plot of earth. Just like it is in heaven. Please allow the Holy Spirit to give you new vision. Thought about Mike talking about teachers starting school in a couple weeks. If you're a teacher, carry him. They need him. If you work on houses, when you leave, let the person you did the work for look at it and go, that's as good as if Jesus had done it. Leave his presence. Leave his aroma. Yes, it's about character. Sure, it's about being honest. But it's also about connecting with the creator so that I'm releasing more than I have the capacity to give. Because it isn't just me. I have a partner. Papa, I thank you that you don't leave us to ourselves in anything. That your grace isn't just about saving us from our sins. It's about releasing us into purpose. Jesus, I thank you that I get to picture you like my son covered in dust and mud and sand and sawdust. Because it tells me you can be where I work. I ask you, Lord, to lift our heads. Give us greater vision for what it is we do. And how the kingdom of God can come through us in that space for the sake of our king. Amen.